Good afternoon, folks. It's about uh, 1 o'clock Eastern. Just give us a minute or two, let some folks pop in, and then uh, Stacy will come uh, give you some of the housekeeping elements. But welcome to the uh, Enbridge Gas Provincial Advanced Building Science Series. This is water management and enclosures. Uh, we have you for the next hour and a half or so. This is uh, Building Science Part 3. We have about 50 people signed in right now. It was 200 uh, signed up, over 200. So we'll just give another minute or two. I'm just gonna go close my door. We're sitting at about 52 people, Gord. Yeah, I think we'll just, it's only um, 101, so I feel like if this was an in-person meeting, people would still be getting their coffee and their donuts and so on. So I feel like we're not wasting any time yet. Where are the donuts, by the way? Weren't you supposed to have someone uh, send those over to you for today? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, isn't it, right? I wonder if Tim Hortons has felt the uh, the COVID nicks. Uh, I know when I go to the donut store, there's not nearly the selection there used to be, so maybe they've been feeling the pinch too. So if I could suggest to all participants, go buy a donut today, please. David writes, donuts are around the pipes at fire separations. <laughs> <laughs> well, the breakfast burritos are good, but you have to make sure that you know that they put chipotle sauce on uh, the breakfast wraps there. <laughs> really? Be prepared. About that or not. Well, we have almost 70 signed in. We are at 10. Three, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do anyway. So, Stacy, why don't why don't we do that? I'll just say welcome again to uh, this session. It's sponsored by uh, Ambridge Gas. You know, such a great industry partner. We really appreciate their interest in advancing building science. But this is part of an adva advanced building science series that we run roughly once a month. Um, and this one we've titled uh, it's it's part three: the critical Canadian home building science. Um, and it's this one's water management and enclosures. You're going to find us today talking primarily on above grade walls. We've done foundations in previous sessions and other elements, roofs uh, next session. So we're going to be focusing primarily on um, uh, above grade uh, uh, walls. I'm really pleased to have my construction structure partner, Justin Wilson. Justin, you're coming to us from uh, from Denver. Happy Denver today. Um, we're hot we're going to be 99 degrees in denver um, but we're nice and cool we're back in the ci uh, experience center in the lab area today so we're doing well it's a pleasure to be here gord and and uh talk about this important subject today and so we're we're working from 1 to 2 30 uh, uh, p.m eastern daylight time uh i think we're in daylight and stacy you had a few sort of uh, housekeeping slides for us I'll come back to Justin in a minute. Yeah, no worries. Um, we are just going to go to the next slide there so people can read along while I just point out the most salient point and that 
if you have a real legitimate question that you have a burning desire to have Justin or Gord answer, uh, please go to your spot down below where it says Q&A. And once you type that in there, it captures that data for us. So that way it'll be part of the whole webinar. When you just put it in the chat feature, it doesn't get saved for us to know that that was a great question. And so we can answer it live or, or have one of the guys uh, type in an answer. So have a question, put it in there. If you just want to chat and say hi to people, talk about breakfast burritos, you're doing it right already. You're putting it in the right spot in the chat part. And so keep your comments considered, thoughtful, respectful as always, I know you will. And if there's any technical glitches, which we can't promise, we've got a storm coming in here in Ontario that might uh, pull, pull up a surprise, but hopefully our backups are all in place. Uh, we should be good to go with all that stuff. But if you're having trouble signing in, please email me and I'll, and I'll catch it there. And at the end of this presentation, uh, the material will be uh, compiled. We'll put it in a nice email with uh, the, the links, the presentation, and that will all get sent out to anyone who has registered for this event. And at the end, we have a survey monkey that goes out and we just really encourage you to please answer that. We like to have that feedback. It helps us make awesome webinars that you're going to listen to today. And we get that feedback. It's a three minute survey and we appreciate that you fill that out. And we're going to do a couple of polls uh, momentarily here, Gord, if we want to get some more information as well. Uh, sure. Do you want to go over the agenda? Yeah, I'll go over the agenda quickly. As you can see, we're doing some introductory remarks, the polls that'll take us to about 110. And then I kind of said to Justin, let's, uh, let's think about some little demonstrations you can do to take us to around 210. And then Justin, you've had so much experience with so many different types of systems, specifically some research that you've been doing. I'll call it building, building material science research that if people have specific questions, we'll leave enough time at the end, say 20 minutes or so, to just allow questions. And as, as Stacy said, uh, put them in the Q&A. We'll try to address them as best we can. So that's kind of where we're, we're headed with that. And then I think Stacy wanted to do a couple of polls. Yeah, and I just, I noticed that one of the participants has raised their hand. And unfortunately, we have that feature uh, not quite working the way most people understand it in other Zoom atmospheres that uh, we don't allow the participants to come on to do any of the actual video chatting um, or be heard online here today, because uh, then we'd have everyone talking. And uh, so the questions uh, really need to go in the Q&A part. If you want to take anything offline, you can uh, just put that question to me in the chat, uh, specifically to me, and I'll make sure that Gordon and Justin get that information to go offline with anything that's more detailed. So right now we're going to launch a few polls and the first one we're going to ask you where you are located, where you're listening to us, whatever part of the world you're listening to us from. That would be great to know. Um, I don't want to assume that everyone's going to be from Ontario because Justin, you're from, you said you're from Denver? Denver, Colorado. That's nice. Me. So that's probably got a whole, whole world of uh, weather that I don't even know about. <laughs> Um, so right now we've got about 81% that have participated here, Gord. Thank you. And I'll share those with you. So great. Uh, we have uh, some 47 from, from Ontario, a few from, and they're always good. The, the West Coast guys are always good as long as we run these in the afternoon. I know they're just getting up, getting going. So that's good of you and pretty good representation, Atlantic provinces. I can't see on my screen how many from the U.S. is, uh, who's, who's joined us. Any from the U.S.? I just have the one on there. Um, we don't have any others, so no one's joining us uh, from any place outside of the North Americas. But we've got the uh, one coming in on the chat saying from Texas. We know who that is. Justin, that's our good buddy. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah. great. Thank you for joining in. Okay, uh, so then we'll do the next uh, poll, if that's okay, Gord. Yep. Okay. And we're going to ask what the occupation is uh, that's bringing us, um, that's bringing people here to us today. We've given them about nine choices and then other, again, if we haven't caught one of the occupations that are on the, the poll, please let us know in the chat what kind of occupation you have.
So far, lots of building renovators. Architects. I guess that's the true form of an architect. I always think like an HVAC designer, or energy evaluator, some engineers, they can be a bit of an architect in some regards. It is true. We should have that category, right? Of architect yeah. slash designer. I don't see it on there. Yeah. My apologies for that. I will fix that next time. Okay, so we've got a pretty good representation in here. So those are the results here, Gord. Wonderful. So yeah, uh, Justin, I think you can see it. Building renovators, to about thirty out of uh, out of our group. So thank you all for uh, for joining in, and hopefully you'll find oh, this great. information practical. I see a one lonely building official inspector. Thanks for joining in. Such a critical element. I know they're all busy these days, but uh, hopefully some have joined in and will view later. So thank you for that. Thirty renovators. That's great, Gord. Yeah. That's really that's some experience there. But uh, nothing like taking things apart, putting them back together. Wow. Right. Let me just go back two slides. I just want to, again, give a shout out to specifically to Susan Cudahy from Enbridge Gas. Sometimes she's able to join, sometimes not. But I, I, I just uh, am always pleased and proud that Enbridge is sponsoring these types of programs. Uh, you know, they just allow us free reign to talk just basic building science without having to chat about uh, particular fuels. They've just had a really great commitment to the industry to help buildings build buildings better. And so we're just very appreciative of, of theirs. I thought I would just take a quick second to just give you a little bit of Justin's background. Uh, Justin is the principal partner at Construction Instruction. What he's coming to you from the CI Live Experience Center. It's roughly 11,000 square foot facility where if you like this building science stuff and you really want to do it hands on, let's let's get you down to the CI Live Center. We run sessions about once a month on different topics. Uh, Justin comes from a background of a, as a HERS Raider. And then down the down the uh, piece there a little bit, you'll see he was the uh, sustainability environmental state sustainability manager with McStay Neighborhoods in Bolo, Colorado. One of the original high performance builders. Justin, back in the day, they were doing how many a year would you would you say in terms of a sustainable community? Well, we would we would do we were a master developer. Um, we also did a big portion of the redevelopment of the old airport that was here in Denver and then a bunch of other infill properties like the old Lowry Air Force Base and things like that. So so it's fairly complicated in some ways because we're dealing with obviously soil issues and contamination issues, but also trying to do green and sustainable designs that we could do. And um, we were doing test houses, which was really fun to do. That was one of my main projects there as well as quality assurance and customer care. Um, but we would have the opportunity to really throw a lot of great things in that would eventually trickle down to, to production. And um, it was it was a wonderful opportunity to, to really try and make a difference there. And we did about 600 units a year when I was towards the end of my career there. That's amazing. And then I'll just go back up to the top, principal partner, but really right now you're spending a lot of time doing uh, building material research there at the CI Live Center, helping manufacturers with good choices. I will say to folks on the call, if you want to know an ASTM standard number, Justin knows them, I think all of them by heart. It, uh, I've never heard somebody rhyme off numbers like he's able to in the various test standards and so on. So, And he'll undoubtedly give you a couple of those today. Go d back down to the bottom and notice that he's a semi-professional race car driver. I sometimes think, Justin, you got the 11,000 square feet so you'd have a place to park your uh, your race car in the winter. Is that, isn't that that the main reason? There's one right over here, yeah. It's about ready to pull out a, a shop uh, tomorrow at lunch. So, um, yeah, it's a, a, a joy and a passion that, that I had as a, as a young boy. Um, and I uh, raced some go-karts and things like that. And, you know, before I got too old, I had to, I had to make a move. And so I do run about uh, eight to 10 weekends a year around the United States. And hopefully I'll get to Canada uh, pretty soon as well. And um, an opportunity to do some, some wheel to wheel uh, combat or racing, if you want to call it that. Sometimes it's more combat than, than racing, but uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's, a, it's a great um, family event. Uh, it's something that, that my son and I do together quite a bit, and I've got a young son, so Very I'm not cool. promising that he's going to be the next uh, Lewis Hamilton or anything like that, but uh, it's, it's sure a great way to spend some time with my boy. 
And uh, then you'll notice at the bottom he speaks three languages, none of them French. So, you know, he can't be a – well, he could be a, a, an honorary Canadian, but wait, he'd have to learn French. But I, I do think you should say uh, good afternoon in, uh, in Swedish because that's one of your languages. If you wouldn't mind, just give us good afternoon in Swedish. Good afternoon. <laughs> there you go. That's, <laughs> that's okay. about it. Sounds pretty similar. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Sure does. Hey, Gord, I got. I have to say one thing though. That years ago I was up and I did a um, a presentation in Calgary for CMHC, and I did get the cowboy hat. I just want you to know. Oh, I there almost you thought go. about bringing it down here to the shop. So I, <laughs> I did get the cowboy hat in Calgary. I've got it at home. Got a boy. So our topics for discussion in the next hour or so is why is water management so critical in high performance homes? People often associate seminars that we do at Building Knowledge with energy performance, enriched gas, energy, always about energy. But Justin, today we wanna to make the link and remind people, frankly, more than remind, uh, uh, basically implore them to, to take account of uh, water management and so why it's so critical. And I'll ask Justin to comment on that just a little bit. And then to, in order to do that, I want to highlight some of the risk factors that we're now seeing that, that complicate our, the business. And then I, I mentioned that the focus will be primarily on best practice for high performance above grade walls. Many of you will have a sense of that. So I actually want to focus more importantly on where water management matters most at the penetrations. Justin, I think you will agree with me. We very rel seldom see failures of, let's call it, in the field, right? The, the eight-foot sheet of stuff, the four-foot piece. Yeah. That's not what fails. The manufacturer's pretty good at that. It's always at transitions, penetrations, and so on. Is that fair from your perspective? Very, very fair. You know, we can, every once in a while, you could have something in the field where, you know, maybe something was riddled with fasteners and, and punctured the, the water-resistant barrier or some of the materials there. But, you know, th this is the point of water in buildings. You know, the, the obvious is that we're building these these low energy buildings and that's where we're going. So these energy flows are slowed down from the indoors to the outer, the outdoors to the in, which of course that building science connection is then the the reduction in drying rates. So that that's an obvious one for us. But, you know, Gord, so here's my sort of thought of, things is last week we had a, a really talented group of uh, builders here from one organization and so this this thing about water it's a it's a super simple molecule um, water molecules like other water molecules and then just think about this fact that it's why we're all here on this planet and when I say that is it's it's the foundation of, of life it's also sort of that contradiction that becomes this thing that is really harmful to our buildings when you give it too much. And th this is the thing that, to kind of hover on that, that as I guess I get older, I think about this is that uh, it's really patient and we're impatient people, right? It's um, water is the most patient thing. It's been here since life has been on this planet. And sometimes we just, we don't think of it that way. We're building a building and saying, you know, well, it's not wet today. And this is what happens when we test things as well. Um, you know, it might not get wet the first time, it might not get wet the second time, but maybe the third time, and you're like, well, that was only three tests, you know, that, that we're talking about a building that's going to be there for decades, generations, may, maybe a century or two, and water just can sit and wait, do its thing on its own, and us as impatient people are like, well, you know, I've never had a problem with that before, or, you know, something like that, that we always, we always hear, and we're just not here long enough to actually pay attention to that that it is, that it, makes sense it does make sense and we talk about it all the time you know the, the decisions builders make today and that's maybe the fourth bullet or fifth bullet there is in some of the finer points for material and method choices understanding that the responsibility is yes you got to pass warranty period got to make money but at the same time houses have a legacy of you know 100 150 years enclosures i'm mm -hmm. going to show one i think you'll be surprised to see it just in a, a picture you provided me some time ago as to you know the age of buildings and so we want to think about those finer points and, and again we have time for questions i know there's lots of uh, items in the chat and i'm hoping stacy's finding some good questions for us out of that um, but let's walk through that i always like to show this house justin you've seen it before this house uh, next door yeah. to me a, a cottage up in southampton it was built in 1868 and, and does that house have issues? There, there's been stucco on that house for over 100 years. How do I know that? Because the lap boards were put on with a Victorian press nails, which we know we haven't been made in over 100 years. And you'll notice the stucco's kind of 
peeling off, but you go, well, at least it's lasted 100 years. When they actually peeled the stucco off, you'll notice that, you know, there's some new boards there that actually did pretty well. You know, it, it yeah, the, underneath the windows and around the door, it's a little problem, but, but, and the question is, why did that house work? And it's really alludes to what Justin said earlier. There was no insulation in this building. So it got wet. My, my neighbor will tell you, Rob, my neighbor will tell you, oh yeah, it, it leaks every rainstorm. But it hasn't really done any damage because it was able to get dry in a big hurry. So these are the kinds of challenges that we need to understand. And we're seeing it every day. You guys are seeing it, the folks on this call. More complicated buildings, cladding systems, roof lines. Watch the path of water. Justin often challenges me to say, watch the path of water. Look to that right of all that water that's coming down in that one little spot. Do we think we're at risk there, right? It's, and you could take this picture roof, anywhere in North America on any given day and find this detail. Is that fair, Justin? Absolutely. Look at that. Look at the roof line, and that's just a typical, typical thing. And I have to say, so so since you made me say something in Swedish, but I could say something else, but this is crazy when you think of it. So the last time I was in Sweden, I took a bicycle around the community. I, I lived there for a few years, a long time ago, and I was looking for crazy complex roof lines. Okay, that was my goal of the day. And I think I found a hip roof in two occasions. Everything else was pretty much just a standard, you know, gable roof. Maybe there was a dormer on it. That was about as complex as it went. And here, look at this thing. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an origami exercise that you've got on the slide here. And it, and it really doesn't add any, some would say some function perhaps, but really it, these are aesthetic issues. We talked about how expensive houses are. Do you think this adds any complexity in terms of cost as well? So the one thing that's happened is more complex. The second we've already harped on, we'll talk about it more, but more insulation means less drying potential. So every time you add insulation to a wall, and in our case, walls, walls have gone from R12 40 years ago to R20, now 22, 24. Some of you are building R30 walls. That means there's less therms, less heat going through that wall, less drying potential, both summer and winter, which is pretty interesting, right? Because now we're air conditioning, and we've set up this moisture regime, certainly along the Great Lakes, not necessarily in Calgary, but we've set up this moisture difference between inside and outside in the summertime. And that's an area of expertise you have in the southeast, Justin, that they have moisture problems uh, associated with, with summer, moisture coming through walls and hitting temperatures that are low enough to cause condensation. Yeah, just moving water and, and when things get wet, the sun is amazing at moving it around. We're going to look at some samples here that we put some heat to and other things as well, but it's it's understanding that that path that water can take and it may be some capillary flow component that that happens as well or a combination of all those things. So it's complicated. And then add to that, of course, we're making houses more airtight, which again means less natural ventilation, which means less drying potential. And we're using building materials, don't get me wrong, great building materials, tremendous strength to weight ratio, tremendous st uh, uh, dimensional stability, but definitely more sensitive to water. It's not a bad building material, but if it gets wet, when it gets wet, we have to think about it getting drier much sooner than previous. And then we have more penetrations, more windows and more penetrations. And every time you put a hole in that, water resistant barrier, then you have increased risk. So these are the risk factors that we're thinking about. I'm looking at this picture on the right. This is a builder who said to me, I've never had these kinds of issues before. And I said, well, have you ever built these kinds of houses before? Look at the risk factors, four different claddings. We have two different types of siding. We have stone, we have brick. Uh, we have that flat roof parapet, if you will, with a slope roof coming into it. We have conditioned space over top of unconditioned space. On the left-hand bottom, you're seeing they're actually watering this building, and within 20 minutes, the water shows up in the kitchen of the unit below, the kitchen ceiling of the unit below, because it's, it's stacked towns, and they're seeing water 20 minutes later that's sprayed on the outside, and you go, how did that get there? And it was following the line in between a subfloor, a two-layer subfloor, which forms part of the fire barrier, if you will, but it's it's causing problems. So the added risk factors is really what we're talking about in, in buildings. And I, I like showing this building because this building was uh, spray foam insulation, which I have no problem with spray foam. It was a builder who said, you know, I've, I've been building houses this way for a long time, but frankly, they're using a window installation method. Notice the red tape, and Justin's gonna comment on that. That is their flashing around the windows. And 
this building is eight years old and already severe structural damage, not because it's spray foam. Let's be really clear. This is not a spray foam issue. The fact is the wall is highly insulated, which means it has no drying potential. So this is a builder been building 30 years, and I've said to him, you've changed your drying potential. Add to that the complexity of the building. This is a case study on its own. I could show you the complexity. There's no overhangs to this window. The deck is right there, high snow loads. So it is some, some amount of capillary flow, water wicking back up. So, and, and you have building materials that are more susceptible to water damage. So these are the kinds of struggles that we're thinking about. I, I even like showing this one. This is a builder offering the new modern designs. And Justin, you're going to point out one other risk factor that we haven't chatted about already. But here's four different cladding choices on basically two houses. And if you walk down the street, they'll be able to point to the ones that are having issues. And no, no surprise, the flat roofs are, are having an issue, the transitions between the flat roof and the walls. But there's one other one on there, Justin, you wanted to chat about, as I recall, that comes down to coloring. Give us, give us a sense of that. Yeah, that dark, that dark color is something because you, when you really start to look at that, you know, that what the sun can do it, and even in a, a Canadian climate, it's amazing because once that stucco gets wet, and then and it will. Trust me, we're testing 14 walls right over here, and they're all water retention. But the the increased temperature that you'll get from the color of that stucco, I've got one in in Denver. Of course, it's a little bit hotter here. The sun's fairly strong. We had, and we talk about flashing tapes a little bit, but I'll get into that. But we're measuring walls around 190 degrees Fahrenheit. And part of that, Gord, is it's the color, the window colors that you're seeing too, this dark bronze colored window. Um, so that's adding to the heat, but you have to realize is that now we're saying R20, R22, 4, R30 in the wall, which is, which is keeping that outside even hotter. It's keeping the people more comfortable inside to some degree, all that insulation, but that temperature delta that you see across that wall is, is significant. And it's gonna push that water into places where you never knew, meaning it's gonna go from a damp state or a wet state, and it's gonna move it with that energy flow into that wall system. And maybe you'll get accumulated liquid, and maybe you'll get wet materials as a result of it. it it's pretty powerful, pretty interesting. And then it goes right back to, we would say design. I showed that complicated building before, but here's a building in Southern Ontario. It's, it's three-year-old home that continues to have water leaks. And you would say, well, why is that? And part of it has to do with design, of course, is that we have these transitions, a, a window to wall to roof transition, all within a matter of you know three or four inches. And what we would say to you is it starts with design. So you follow the path of water. As I said, Justin challenges me to do all the time. Where will the water land? Where will it be concentrated? What transitions, interruptions will it face? What building materials will it impact? What level of detailing will be required? And so really in your mind, as you walk your buildings tomorrow, think about or this afternoon, consider three conditions. Is there an opening in the assembly? Is water present near that opening? And is there a force that could move water through that opening? That's what you need to challenge yourself with and up your water management details accordingly is where we want to go. And of course, that has a little bit to do with designing for successful water management it has to do with the climate zone you're in. You, you could be forgiven, I guess, in the prairie provinces to say, well, we're pretty dry here. But we also know because of the complexity of houses, you're really cold, you're really hot, huge temperature ex extremes that you're seeing that other parts of the country don't see. Of course, on the West Coast, you need to think about the amount of precipitation in in southern ontario you need and and uh, ottawa and so on along in montreal and atlantic provinces you need to think about the high humidity levels all summer long and the fact that we're air conditioning creating this separation this difference in temperature and moisture that drives moisture through your building so finding building materials that are appropriate for that climate as well it's pretty powerful and we'll i gotta just say do, gordon Justin, wind, sorry, wind on that just for a second that i i can't say enough about looking at in your specific climate regions, and one of the first things I try and do is look at what are the prevailing wind directions because the typically, and I've been to many projects where um, there you go, in Denver, for example, I'll, I'll use this because we're sitting here today, we get this strong gust out of either, the, we'll get it directly out of the south, but almost always it comes out of the northwest. And I've gone to buildings where you look right in the corner of some part of a building or, or some aperture in the building, and you go, it's leaking right there, I guarantee it, because we get these tremendous 20, 30, 40, 65 mile an hour winds when it's raining. And so that has a, a significant impact on how it can pressurize that building and, and move and migrate water in ways that's it's 
it's it's it's extraordinary is all I can say. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and so I'll just give you the theory, just three seconds of, of theory, understanding that moisture comes in three forms, solid, liquid, and vapor. It does all its damage primarily in liquid form. That is, we could care less about the ice and snow until it turns into a liquid. We could really care less about water vapor until it condenses into a liquid. And then understand that we have four moisture flow mechanisms. We're really only going to talk about two today, in fact, really just one. But the mo and, and we're going to talk about the two most important, which is liquid water flow, gravity driven rain. That's what we're talking about today, water management. We're not talking about vapor diffusion or vapor barriers. That's very way far down on the list. We're, for the most part, we're not going to talk about air transport today. We've done air tightness sessions before. We're going to talk about liquid water flow, capillary flow, capillary flow. Uh, in buildings and uh, on those above grade walls and because it's the most important of that. This is an animation, uh, you know, Justin's been responsible for construction instruction, the app and the animations. I always like to play this one to give us some context of how things work in buildings and the four mechanisms for water management, deflection, drainage, drying, and durability. Understanding that we used to rely on roof and roof overhangs for most of water deflection. But more recently, because of house designs, taller houses, less overhangs, we're now relying on the cladding system, the brick, the stucco, the stone. And so that deflection is important, but it's changed. We need to recognize that those cladding systems are not watertight, but they are designed to deflect 90 to 95 percent of the water away. And then we need to understand that the five, one to five percent of the water that gets behind needs to drain out. And a big word today, if you're a note taker, you're going to get the slides anyway, but think about drainage or go get this app and the animations. Think about drainage. How, when, what, not if, when water gets behind your cladding system, how's it getting back out? And we'll talk about these. We have some strategies for you here in a second, but second on the list is drainage. Down the list by an order of magnitude is drying. We said we have less drying potential, but you do want to choose building materials specifically on the outside of houses that are vapor permeable. Water, if water does get into the wall, that it's allowed to dry typically to the outside, right? We're primarily in northern climate, so most of our drying potential is to the outside. And then, of course, every material we choose, we need to think about the durability, pressure treated in some cases. But really, we would spend, say, spend your money on deflection and drainage. Drying is less of an issue if you've got good deflection, good drainage, and, and worry less about the build, building material as long as you've got good deflection, good drainage. So that's kind of the theory. I'll just re-highlight those and say there are four strategies, proper design to get 90, 95% of the water away, designing drainage systems, and Justin, you'll be aware of, you tell me the standard of a drainage efficiency, right? There's a drainage efficiency standard for WRBs, for drainage systems. That, that They use that at Pacific Northwest, I know. Uh, and as I understand, it uh, has to show 95% of the water out in 75 minutes, something like that? Yeah, it's, it's it's greater than 90. I think it's greater than 95% in 60 minutes and the way minutes. the test is done. Is that 2273? ASTM 2273? I think it is, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And and it's 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 important, but you realize that water does get behind stuff. And I, and I like your, you know, 5 to 10%. We do quite a few tests and that would be an E1105 modified test where there's cladding on a building over a water resistive barrier. So we'll have a window installed, um, flashed, uh, trimmed and siding on it and nearly every time when you do that with the, the test with the wind force on it and a measurable and applied uh, amount of water to that wall system gourd there's water back there every time there's water back there it, it's perfect as you think it is that the water passes through that cladding material so yeah and the question is is it enough for long enough right that whole idea of you say water's patient and what we need to do mm -hmm. is help that water dry out before it does damage and we have less drying potential mm -hmm. is, is the point or drain so it out you. drain it out keep draining it out i wanted to mention and this is partly for justin's benefit but our national building code of canada and then subsequently of course the ontario building code and national building code is going to be adopted across the country here in the next couple of years anyway National Building Code calls for a second plane of protection behind most cladding systems. It does give some options for, I'll say, barrier systems, but the common options, of course, historically have been building papers, synthetic sheathing membranes, insulated foam sheathing with sealed joints can also classify as a second plane of protection, and other panel-type pr products with, with sealed joints. But we've 
typically, historically, have done that building paper. And nothing wrong with that, except we need to remind ourselves that things have changed. Those building materials, paper-based products, used to have the ability to dry out. Less have, they don't have as much drying potential. Justin, I thought I'd show this slide. This is, uh, I think, from your homeland, wasn't it, that you were telling me about? This picture actually came um, from near Central City, Colorado, up in the ah. mountains. Um, and that is a mining cabin that was built around 1858, 1865, somewhere in that, that little period. But look, it's on, top of a, it's on top of a hill. They knew it was gonna be windy, trying to stay warm in a really hostile climate. So it's at high elevation. And that, that rosin paper, notice that it's on both sides of the wall. So they, they didn't have insulation, but they realized like, okay, we gotta keep water out of this thing, but we're also gonna try and keep air out of this building too. Cause I guess it's a little drafty when it's you know, minus 20 and the wind's blowing. And it was interesting. So the history, you and I know, the history of building papers was they originally designed as air barriers to keep the air out. And then they just got grandfathered in as a weather barrier. And they worked reasonably well because they got wet, they were able to get dry, they became that second plane protection. There's really not a lot of testing that shows that in today's world that they're providing what we want, but they've gotten grandfathered in as a weather barrier. I'm not saying they don't work. I'm just having us understand that that wasn't the history. There was no science behind them becoming a weather barrier or a water resistant barrier, but just wanted to give you a sense of that. But you'll notice on, on this slide, you know, the building paper on the left, a, a synthetic house wrap in the middle, um, and then a, a foam sheathing with, uh, with sealed joints acting as the uh, a plane of protection and what we need to do with that. And so we're gonna chat about that. And then we would say there are some pretty good standards in Canada for proper installation because we said the materials themselves aren't what fail, it's at the penetration. So the window manufacturers and the manufacturers of, of WRBs, generally speaking, are aligned. I think that's a fair statement, Justin. I look at every oh, yeah. window manufacturer's uh, in installation guidelines and I look at every WRB manufacturer's installation guides, they're pretty much aligned in terms of flashings and so on. Is that a, would you agree with that statement? I would think, and there's, you know, down this side, we've got um, Fenstration Manufacturers Association or AMA, um, and, and they've, they've really kind of set, you know, as a governing body from WRB manufacturers, window manufacturers, door manufacturers coming together neutrally and testing uh, different assemblies and, and sharing that information to come up with what's worked and what's not worked. A good example is uh, that that's one where how did you get pan flashing at the rough opening of the window on the sill? This is how it came about as multiple people were testing and making complementary products and, and so forth and, and testing and talking about it. That's one of the most important things is what have you had success with from the field, but also, you know, can we come up with ways like we do here at the lab is can we repeat a test result from component A to B to C? And the answer is sometimes, right? We try anyways. And, and that's the point I want to make here is if if you uh, ended up in trouble, somebody said, well, what standard did you did you install to? Well, I just did what I've been doing for a long time and the building inspector passed it. I want people on this call to know. In fact, I want you to ask the question of the local building department, the jurisdiction having authority. Do you folks do a uh, an inspection of the weather water resistant barrier? And what you're going to find is most building departments are going to say, actually, no. We inspect your thermal barrier, we inspect your air barrier, but we do not do an inspection, nor and we do do not show an inspection. You go, well, why not? Well, because that's your responsibility as a builder. So the fact that the building department didn't call you out on it doesn't mean you pass code. It meant they're leaving it up to you to pass code. As you know, that's the that's the that that, that is in fact the responsibility of builders under the building code. So. I would say to go look for that consistent information. And when we're talking about choosing a water resistant barrier, I want to remind you that there are three primary performance characteristics. The water holdout ability, it's vapor permeance, the ability for that uh, material to dry or to breathe, and it's air holdout. We won't go into it each, uh, each one of those, but on the right hand side, this happened to be Winnipeg, Manitoba, there's on this one house, there's five different WRBs that are used and each one of them have different performance specs and they vary by a factor of about 20. That is the one on the bottom left, if you will, has very low permeance, very low water holdout, uh, pretty good on air holdout versus the one to the top right, 
uh, actually has 20 times better drying potential and five times the amount of water holdout capabilities. And so you, you just, to my mind, have to rethink and ask each manufacturer you're working with, what is your water holdout? What's your vapor permeance? What's your air holdout? Before you start talking price and so on and set a benchmark. And that's something we can help you with that uh, Justin, you often help with at CI is to help people make good decisions on those WRBs. I want to play this one, Justin, and then we'll have you do the animation, not the animation, but the little video clip sort of contracting oh, sure. what Canada does, if you wouldn't mind. So this one is an animation we provided for a specific manufacturer, but just showing installation details, a couple of key thoughts, and notice how bottom of wall kicking water to be able to kick water out of the bottom of that wall. Uh, proper button cap fasteners is really critical. Notice the skip taping at the bottom, which could be full tape or skip tape. Skip tape allowing water to, to drain back out. In this case, using a caulking at the top, so that gives us an air barrier detail. Notice the overlaps, the proper overlaps as specified by the manufacturer. And interesting to me, every water resistant barrier manufacturer I've seen uses exactly these same details, including the button cap fasteners. So just showing that kind of the coverage, if you will, look at the few number of seams or joints in this wall. Really, it's nine foot sheets of stuff, so you're seeing proper tape of both horizontals and verticals. So what I wouldn't mind though, Justin, I'll stop sharing. Uh, I'd asked you to kind of put together a clip, you did it for <laughs> us a little while ago, um, but a clip of kind of the, what I see a lot of in Canada, if, if we could play that clip is. Uh, it, sure, let's play great. that clip. All right, so here we are in the shop at CI Live and we're building a wall just for this Canadian example. Non-sheet, so we're gonna actually use bracing to hold this small six by six uh, frame that we've built with a one window opening in it. We're gonna use a typical, what we've been told is a typical uh, one inch foam layer attached with uh, tuck tape. And then uh, the window's gonna be sealed in, the joints are gonna be sealed with tuck tape. We did put this strapping in here. Uh, we have T-bracing as well, but of course we had to go through the window. So we put the strapping on, trimmed it off, but we have kind of a modified X, just this to hold this together while we put it on our spray rack. So. Here we go. We're going to put this thing together, finish it up, and uh, get it ready to test for spring game. Well, there you have that. Um, hopefully, it, and you know the outcome of this one, Gord. So we did this one last year. Um, we don't have the clip of the water test on it, but um, what I recall was um, we got that wall to leak pretty quick. Yeah, I do recall so much so that we were asked not to show it again. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't ever do that again. The first place that it that it leaked is we got water. Um, so that the window wasn't caulked in, there wasn't pan flashing at the opening as you saw there. We used the tuck tape, which we've actually just done the test on it just for fun for you all again, um, which it did okay. Um, but once we got water to get between the foam and the tuck tape, because there are joints and gaps that, that somewhere you've got a lap on your tape, for example, just a little bit of water got in. We got water in and we had the bottom of that window taped in, as I recall, and then we got, so it was holding water in that got behind the the, the tape around the window opening, and then it just flooded the opening. It was actually one of the, the fastest leaks we've ever got on a wall out of, I'd, I'd say we've tested 250 walls down here in the last few years. And so, I will so. get you to queue up because it, they would like to see the water test and I'll, obviously they should come down, but we'll run that in just a second if Travis could get that ready. But I just want to comment, I noticed you took some really nice time 
to actually try to uh, seal that foam or at least uh, compression fit that foam. Let's be really clear. Every tape manufacturer would say you have to do a pressure roll or pressure adhesion to make sure it's uh, doing right. And I will also say that foam manufacturer would not approve that tape as a weather barrier. I, that, let's be really clear. That's not the manufacturer saying use that tape. That's Canadians telling you to use that tape or your local building department. There are tapes that are approved for phones, so we should make that distinction. And then I do have a and picture later, Justin. <coughs> Gord, you would, one thing you would have seen too is that we had to tape that, if you saw I was dealing at all, even the corners and the top, it's because when we put our enclosure on the back of it to do an air and water holdout test. I've got to have that thing installed like a, a, a real dandy air barrier, I got to tell you, as much as we can seal it up because everything leaks when you when you put the fans on it. So we've got to just button it up. So anyways, there's that. Can we run that clip of the water test? So we'll run, yeah, I think this is one with the water barrier on it. So let's see, Travis can run that next clip. So here we are, CI Live. We've got uh, the first test wall that we built uh, today, and we're going to do a water and wind test on this to see how well the whole enclosure is holding out water and air in this particular case. Um, we do test pretty much everything here at CI Live. It's a hot day in Denver. We're looking forward to doing this test. It's about 93 degrees, and we're baking in the sun. So once we get this water going, we'll get some evaporative cooling to get the crew all cooled off here. So. What we do, and you can hear this fan running in the background, is we have a, an enclosure on the rear that's airtight. Um, you can also see through it so we can see if there are any leaks. Um, and here you can see what we do is we suck the air out of that space back here um, with the fan that you hear running. And you can even see that even the Tyvek layer, if it's performing as an air barrier, is, is resisting that airflow as well. But by sucking the air out of the enclosure, we're tricking it to think that there's a wind force being applied to the front of this wall, and then we're going to spray uh, this water out of this spray rack at the wall as well. So if there is a hole, the water, um, the wind and water will move through those holes simultaneously. So what we're going to do is a water and wind test, a pretty extreme one. Uh, we're going to do a 15 minute cycle, but we're going to do two gallons of water per square foot of surface area of our, of our sample. We're going to do a 50 mile an hour simulated wind force for 15 minutes. We're gonna run this test at four minutes with water and wind. We're gonna pause that wind, the fan, for one minute, and then we're gonna repeat, repeat that two more times. And so um, that's, the, that's what we're gonna do. And um, one of the things that we typically will do in advance here is we've got, this is a, a smoke puffer, and we'll go around the assembly of all the different nooks and crannies, and we'll apply smoke to it to see if we get any leakage into that enclosure. And one area that we've already seen is that we have at these windows, by puffing these corners, we've got a pretty good plume of smoke coming in at the, the corners of this single hung window of the operator panel. So let's hope that the water doesn't leak actually through the window unit itself. Um, but let's, we're ready to start testing. We're gonna put blue dye on here. So let's get busy with the test. All right, time for water. Here we go. We're gonna get our gauges all set up and we are gonna add today blue water. and the water off. If you ever come here for a class, uh, we can all just get in here and take a peek. And I had about two drips and it came from a bolt that's up here. We had sealed it, but apparently our seal wasn't as good. 
um, but everything else on the wall appears at this point to be 100% dry. That is a successful, successful first test at the extreme 50 mile per hour uh, wind force. Um, so now we're ready to take this back into the shop. That's kind of cool. Justin, I think you were the first to say, we know that's an extreme test. One, because there's no cladding yep. on there. I remember when John Straub first saw this clip, he goes, come on, there's no cladding on there. You got to do the cladding. But this, you do this for specific purposes to help builders kind of understand the choices they're making. Yep. And we'll, we'll do it with cladding as well. We'll do it with rain screens, without rain screens. We've done cement siding. And now we've got this whole battery of walls that we did last year that have stucco on it with all different water resistant barrier layers from grade D papers to perforated wraps to um, different intervening layers like rain screens or mineral wools or foams on it. So we're learning a whole, whole lot from that. And again, as I said, we've got 14 more to go here this summer, just of those and they'll all get tested two and possibly three times. Yes, it's extreme, but here's the other thing that we'll typically do. We'll typically run not a 50 mile an hour wind force, and I do it all the time here at the shop because it's like, well, the wall's here, so let's just keep it going. 15 minutes isn't really enough to see what happens. And so sometimes we'll have a wall that maybe we've done that 15 minute test on, but then we'll go back and we'll run it at 15 or 20 mile an hour wind force in a third of the water application rate and let it run uh, pause on and off for 30 minute cycles for several hours in some instances to see really what happens. Here's the thing that we learn the most from it when you take it apart. And we rarely ever have an opportunity and things that we've paid for to build that we put customers in where we can actually go back and actually extract the window out of the opening and go, huh, whoever thought the water could come in this little crack or this little area in the head flap where we missed the taping slightly or, or something like that. Um, we learned a lot about, uh, and we talked about it last year at, at spring training camp, was when it's really dry here, whether it's in Phoenix, we used to be in Phoenix at our shop and now we're here in Denver, really dry time, some of the one component window and door foams we get, there's not enough available moisture. It actually moisture cures, there's not an, enough available moisture. In that small annular space um, where you're trying to fill, it looks perfect on the back where you can see it, but inside there's no available moisture. And so you get an incomplete cure to some of those one component foams. And they were actually, when you take the window out, you're like, look at that, the foam never even cured along the side of the window frame. So there's a lot of learning that goes on there. And extreme as it might be, um, one thing we can do is we can create a re repeatable test condition, whether that's at a low wind speed or a high wind speed, but we can repeat the same amount of water from sample A, B, C, and D and we can, we can understand how they perform. And that's, that's really what the, the magic is of that too, is yeah, it's like doing blower door testing, right? We, we apparently all agreed on 50 Pascals was the pressure difference, either positive or negative. Typically it's negative. And, and that gives us a, a fairly repeatable result on ACH at 50 Pascals from my house to yours, right? And, and so there we are. Exactly. And, and we will say, and you said it earlier, windows leak that, Joe Stiebrick always, I learned from Joe, it's not a leak if it leaks to the outside. So the whole key here is to understand that even the best of detailing may leak, but then what do I want to do? I want to make sure, and I want to show some more animations and so on, of let's making sure good detailing, by all means do the good detailing at the window, start with the right materials, the good decisions, but then think about if water gets in, how does it get back out? So I think that's pretty critical. I'll just continue on here and share again, mm -hmm. and we can continue on and, um, uh, in our little presentation here. Let me get rid of this one. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say, and you're starting to allude to this, that at least get it right. What we're seeing is when you do um, uh, your water resistant barrier, it's less about the material, it's more about the details. Look at the one on the left. In theory, right, the building paper should be over top of the roof flashing. The window flashing should be over top of the uh, WRB. And the, and the flashing details should be something that actually sticks to something. So even the best materials, the good materials like on the right, you still need to make sure that you're not reverse lap. So I'm always thinking about, and I, I know, Justin, you really love this one on the left, this really nice bottom of wall detail because you see a lot of issues there. I don't see it well done, particularly across North America. Just speak to that one just for a second. Yeah, and, and actually we're going this afternoon after this session to with 30 project managers and superintendents to to revisit one of these exact details like on the left. And it's an adhesive um, peel and stick through wall flashing. 
that's covering that joint. It's going to be the brick ledge. This also will have brick. We have many here that have brick in this in this area. And it's extending back up behind the water resistive barrier and it's counter flashed where it meets the wall. So it's extending up the wall. It's got a bed of sealant right here and the water resistive barrier is lapped over it. Um, for air control, it'll most likely get taped. This house would have been taped from the builder that I know, but that's a, a detail. Then as those brick layers go together, is there a, a mortar net to catch the mortar droppings from plugging the bottom of the wall? What type of weep are you using? Is it, a, is it a rope? Is it a weep hole? Or is it really a weep vent that allows maybe some airflow and also just really free water drainage through that? And then on the right hand side, I kind of alluded to there are tapes that are approved for foam. Foam, as Justin's going to show you here shortly or quickly, foam does move. It expands and contracts. So I'm going to have to use a, a proper tape. And, a, and, and there was a question in the chat. How would I know what's a proper tape? My word is or my, uh, my uh, comment is get a letter of compatibility from every manufacturer who touches another manufacturer's product. Why do I say it that way? Because that's what exactly what the City of London required about seven years ago was everybody to get letters of compatibility. So manufacturers, window manufacturers, the WRB manufacturer, the tape manufacturer, the sealant manufacturer, all to say, yes, ours is a system. And when we do testing, when testing's done, the ASTM standards, it's all about compatibility of materials that we want to look at. And here you have it. Not two great products, frankly. That sheathing tape's a good product, but it's not designed to go on foam. The foam's a great product, but it's not designed to be taped with sheathing tape. On the right-hand side, that is approved tape by that manufacturer, but it's not installed correctly. It's not pressure rolled. It's not given the way it's not installed the way it's supposed to be installed. So we just have to keep sense of that. And I like to show these. The, this this tape and some would say I've switched to blue tape well get me the letter of compatibility that says blue tape can, can be attached on the right hand side to a sheet metal vent is that really what's required and you can see a lot of time and effort's gone to done the, to do this but it's just not sealing correctly this was a job up in Ottawa the guy said to me that's sealed on the left hand side we went up to it I just took my finger just pulled it back ever so slightly notice how it's yellowed already that tape is not sticking to that vinyl. It's not designed to be sticking to that particular piece. So we need to think about compatibility of products. And that I wouldn't mind if we could go to Justin, show me the tapes. You Show me what you were talking about there if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. So if we can jump to this, I we do this quite a bit. And, and so we actually just looked at, we did this for you all over the last couple of days because Gord said, wow, that'd be great. So here's the first, the first thing, and you said, Gord, that that uh, foam products would expand and contract. So we, we took this one to a fairly high temperature and it, it did kind of melt it. Uh, the, the manufacturer since lightened the color of this up so it was absorption was going on. But this sample, when we got it to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, it started at 13, 16 and 3 sixteenths of an inch and it went to 16 and 7 sixteenths. So it grew over a quarter of an inch. So in, in a, basically a 16 inch run. But this tape actually did Hold. And this is one that's approved to go over XPS. It would typically be over that pink stuff, I think, that you showed. But this particular tape has got pretty good flexibility to accommodate for the movement that this, this foam product is going to experience and also remain adhered to the surface of the foam. So there's a lot thinking there is it's, it's a compatible component, as, as you say. Um, don't know if it's supposed to go over this, but realize it's, it's going to grow. And there is, really is an ASTM standard D2126. So I was going to get you, Gord, threw another one in there. But um, it actually gives you the information and the manufacturer's specs on, on samples that they had, would have done out of QA um, on the thermal expansion at various temperatures, both cold and hot. Um, just looking at some of the different uh, adhesive flashing tapes that we've got, though, so we ran a bunch of these on this board and we actually put it in the oven, 176 degrees. So this was June uh, 14 and 15. Typically this would be 24 hours um, constant. We did it in eight hour bursts because we didn't want to leave the oven on here in the shop. So overnight, but we left it at basically 176 degrees, eight hours. And then we left it off at night again for another eight hours. And so various different uh, flashing tapes that, that we used here. And we went from different acrylic tapes. Some of these look familiar. Um, this was an acrylic. This one's a butyl tape, another butyl tape that we sourced out of Europe. Um, this was an acrylic that we sourced here out of uh, this area. Another, this was uh, a vapor permeable. It's a perforated house wrap with an acrylic 
coating on the back. You can see it lost its, its bond here. You can see it's, it's not hanging onto this water resistive barrier or 100% to this OSB, but different acrylics. We also noticed, which was a strange thing, we noticed just from a compatibility side, almost every one of these acrylics, except for this one and this one, when we got them up to the higher temperatures, which is actually a bubble underneath this one right now, and there's a little bit under this one, um, they started to, they were perfect on the water resistive barrier, but I haven't understood the mystery yet of why we got under temperature exposure around six hours in, we started to get some air bubbles in here. I don't know whether we went above the temperature threshold of those acrylic sealants or not. I've got to dig into that just a little bit. Maybe somebody on the, on the call knows as well. So let's transition to a few others. Um, this is a rubberized asphalt flashing tape, and here you can see that it got a delamination to it. And so this sticky rubberized asphalt is all melting right here. This was your tuck tape. It did okay. Um, it didn't really lose its bond, but the end of it shrunk right over here, which is kind of an interesting thing. It actually curled up on the end and pulled off the OSB. It's stuck to the OSB and it's, it's stuck to the, the, this is a Tyvek layer here. This foil one has some dimensional issues right around here. This one looks like it just got burned, but it shrunk. This was a rubberized asphalt, and within about two hours, the top sheet right here is what's it rolled right up and left its adhesive all over the place. These were butyl rubbers with different top sheets um, that are here. This one actually was um, that was flex wrap. This one has got a lot of butyl on it. It laid down really nice, like this one we sourced out of Europe. This is a knockoff product, which is rubberized asphalt that's supposed to be like this one, and here you can see how much it's actually balled up and wrinkled up. Here's the other thing is you talk about compatibility cord. When I flip this over, you can clearly see this would be the one right here that rolled up. And you can see the dark staining that we've got here, hopefully in the light. This is the other one that was next to it, a rubberized asphalt. This is another rubberized asphalt where the, the actual material is leaching through into the water resistive barrier. This one as well, this knockoff flexible flashing tape. So you have to ask yourself long-term, is there any damage or degradation that would happen to a, a water resistive barrier? And we see that a lot as well, where when you read the directions, it says like, oh, do not put this material in contact like some of these with an acetyl silicone adhesive sealant. And you're like, why is that? Well everything that holds out the water and air could be actually dissolved by it or destroyed by it. So, so that's a, a big one. And we do those tests. So this AMA standard, there's an ASTM standard that complements it, but I actually forgot that number, to be a type three tape. So they have a, a grade one, two, and three is 176 uh, Fahrenheit for 24 hours. Well, you can see at eight hours, a lot of these don't even make it. The bottom of an AMA standard tape, like an AMA 711 standard, um, the bottom of those, some of these lower tapes that are rolling up, it's 122 Fahrenheit. I'm not converting well to C, but there's a big difference between 122 Fahrenheit and 176. And the reason I always test them at 176 is because I measure walls in almost any climate zone that I go in that has this issue that actually achieves that temperature. Some of these that do this, they melted, I got curious about these temperature thresholds because years ago I would get called to job sites and around window trim or stucco where the casing beads met the window frames and these dark colored windows, I would actually see this black stuff and the builders would call me. They keep cleaning this black stuff that's bubbling out and coming out and staining the paint. And I'm like, could that really be the flashing system melting on the building? And lo and behold, you can see indeed it is. It is interesting, and I, I, I'm smiling here because I had a a, a builder. I wa I went by his his site, and he caught the, the big sign said "Luxury Townhouses," and I kind of joking with him. I said, "What does luxury mean?" Well, you know, we had architect design. It's got black windows, and it's got that dark cladding. I, I guess that's what makes it luxury. The color makes it luxury, and because otherwise it was pretty standard uh, uh, townhouses. And so I want to challenge folks and to say, have you measured the temperature on hot summer's day? we got a really hot day going here. What is happening and how long is that there for? Imagine the exposure, you know, the west face mm -hmm. from about 4 o'clock in the afternoon right up until 9 oh, o'clock at night. Yeah. There you got five, six hours of really strong sun. So pretty powerful. I'll, I'll, uh, and, we have only and I, I can 
Go ahead. I can tell you real quickly, though, if, you, if I were to make suggestions, some of these acrylic tapes um, that we're using really uh, thermally cycle well. But I can say from a nail sealing component, meaning as you drive trim nails and, and cladding nails through, you've got more body to some of these butyl tapes. There's more material in them and they're gonna seal and not melt around the nails. And this, this is what, what I saw is when we started to take a building apart, where that dark colored cladding was in the staples and nails, if they were coming all the way through, for example, the siding, it would actually literally take about a, a quarter sized hole and melt because the nail was conducting the heat painted dark on the outside of some of these asphalts. It would actually dissolve that flashing material gone. Wow. I'm seeing better nail sealing from the butyls. Some of the acrylics are really thin. You get really good bond. They're hard to reposition. So you got to really nail it when you put them on the building. I mean, you got to be perfect when you set it because you can never really reposition them. But they don't have a lot of that nail sealing characteristic of it as well. They'll do fine. But I just see some of these these rubbery butyls seem to be some of the favorites that we've had as far as temperature and, and water freeze cycling and so forth like that. So and, and I'll just reiterate that and say, this window's already leaking. If you look inside the window, it's still under fr at framing stage and it's already leaking. And there's five different manufacturers standing out there all going, well, it's them, it's them, it's them. And it turns out the compatibility, the window manufacturer said, I'm sorry, our windows are not approved for an asphalt-based flashing. And so you've already voided the warranty out the windows. That was a big revelation for the builder. So a letter of compatibility from every manufacturer who touches another manufacturer's product. And then I do want to harp just for a minute on some of the elements you were talking about on the window, the proper flashing details. I'll remind folks here, the National Building Code of Canada has requirements for head flashing, requirements for installation of products. We won't go into it today, but be mindful of the building department isn't necessarily inspecting this, but you're still required to meet these requirements. And on the bottom right, you can see the head flashing, for example, that the requirements for it would extend not less than 50 millimeters, two inches up the back side. So lots and lots of requirements that I some most of the time see missing is, is where we're at. And finding, an, and if you say, well, it doesn't really matter. Well, here's, here's 72 townhouses, and out of 72 townhouses, they had major structural damage in, in 12 of them in less than five years, major structural damage of the rim joist below uh, in 12 of them. They had uh, uh, major mold issues in something like 28 of them, and they had water leaks out of the 72, noticeable water leaks in, of 48 out of 72. And you go, well, how come those leaked and those didn't? Well, you talked about it earlier, uh, Justin, the orientation uh, of the house. That is somewhere on the north side. Our wind is, some of you will know, at least in southern Ontario, our most damaging storms typically come from the southeast. Most of our wind comes from the west, but our most damaging storms is when they have a little bit of an inversion come from the southeast. So notice on the right-hand side, fungus and rot in less than three years on that rim board below these patio doors. So finding ways to mitigate those risks is what we want to get to. And I just want to walk through quickly. We won't do too many more slides. We're at 206, and uh, you know I want to get some time for to answer questions. So. Uh, Stacy, hopefully you're uh, uh, collecting up some of those. But I always challenge builders to think about the 10-point scale. You know, when you go get an oil change done, you know, they'll say it's a 20-point, a 28-point oil change. This is the 10-point window install. And when you think about it, the first thing you'd want to do is slope the sill. And I thought it was pretty interesting. Our good friend Mike Memmi at Mountain View Homes said they slope the sill. And he's a production builder, and yet they're able to slope the sill. Some do it with a piece of bevel siding. Uh, some actually do uh, uh, shims underneath the, uh, the jacks, but slope the sill would be point number one. Point number two is properly installed weather-resistant barrier with proper button cap fasteners. Point number three is the proper eye cut, so you keep the head clean, the sill clean, and you protect the jams. That's point number three. Point number four, as we flip back around, is to make sure that you have shingled and lapped the top of the window. And sometimes we're using a, 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 a box window, sometimes a, a flange window. Point number five would be a fully protected pan flashing. It doesn't have to be this product, but pan flashing on the window sill. As Justin mentioned, it leaks at the top, it does it damage at the bottom. Point number six is that roller, pressure roller. Point number seven is caulked on three sides, not the bottom, to let water out. Point number eight is the window going in with the proper <clears throat> fasteners of that window, manufacturer's recommendation. Point nine is the proper side and head flashings, not tape, but an actual flashing product. And point number 10 is pulling that back down over top to make sure I've got 
uh, a good uh, water management. And notice here they've skipped tape. So as an air barrier, you might say, well, uh, I want it fully taped. Skip tape gives you a little added forgiveness. If there is water that gets behind the WRB, it's coming over top of the flashing. And then I just wanted to highlight, you have a couple of choices, more than a couple of choices for flexible pan flashings. The one on the right is called SureSill. Uh, that's in a large opening, but it has a slope built into it, a plastic product. On the left, you have a flexible flashing product. There's peel and sticks. On the left-hand side is the fluid applied. In the middle is a peel and stick that you do a little bit of um, uh, origami to, to, to give you the, the technology. And, and the right-hand side, again, is flexible peel and stick. So there's lots and lots of options for that. Justin, here's that foam. I thought I'd put that picture in. Remember Justin said the foam. Oh, you pulled really it. Cured? You pulled it apart in the shop. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's there you go. We've seen that many, many times. So foam is not an appropriate water barrier. And we're to the point now where we would recommend if you want to foam the, the sides and the top, fine. But down along the bottom edge, we would actually say back rod and caulk, the bottom edge up as high as about six inches, Justin. Does that make sense? Yeah. Typically the outline of the pan flashing, so extending up the vertical six inches and then a very robust seal at, at the bottom because that's where because you're not caulking that that outside you want the drainage to occur there well if you miss on the interior side gourd of course my my entire control line is on the back edge of that window so any little margin that you miss there under mm -hmm. wind load the water is going to walk right up behind that window flange and there it goes into the into the rough opening it's interesting isn't it and then i wanted to show because we are doing a lot of foam uh exterior cladding uh, sheathing sorry and I just wanted to show the detailing here. It, again, we would promote the concept of a WRB. It literally could be black paper, nothing wrong with that. But looking at the detailing of how do I get that done when I'm doing one inch of insulated sheathing. And here all we're showing is bucking out the window the same depth of the insulated sheathing, whether it's a mineral wool, whether it's a, a foam-based product. The, that product going on like it normally would. <clears throat> This we're showing structural sheathing in behind. It doesn't have to be. We could be doing the, the wind bracing. But again, now the WRB is going on pretty much the way it would normally would. All we really need to think about is fasteners that are slightly longer to get us back through the insulated sheathing. So a longer fastener button cap that gets us back to the structural sheathing or to the studs so that we get proper adhesion. Other than that, when we see the window going in, and we won't do the whole window, but we'll think about um, from there, the window, what's nice about the buck, the, uh, the wood frame buck, is now you have really solid attachment points, but you'll notice that the window goes in at this point basically the same way as it did before. And now a water, uh, sorry, a, a fully pan flash, and we're in pretty good shape. So I would just say that's kind of where we want to go. I just want to point out again the, the need for a J roller. I remember doing a session in South Carolina and the lumber yard who's doing the install immediately, they knew I was coming, they bring out the J roller and said, see, and it, it still had the the, uh, the sales tag on it. In other words, they never used it, uh, but he was kidding me a little bit. So I just wanted to show that. I also wanted to talk through this one, Justin, you've done a lot of work on this. Mm -hmm. This is a slightly different version. We know in high performance, we want to get to more exterior sheathing. And at some point we would say, you know what, y you probably want to use a structural sheathing. In this case, the WRB is going on first. You're going to flash the window the way you normally do. WRB going on first. Notice the drip cap, kind of that Canadian detail. All of these animations, by the way, play on construction instruction. You have access to all of them through that website if you don't already know it. There's about 50 different, maybe 100 different animations, Justin. But notice least, it's yeah. going on. And now what I'd like you to do is just walk us through or talk us through the installation of the foam at this point, Justin. So the foam is several inches thick. Um, so it's two inches. Um, so that's going to leave it you know, hanging further than um, the, the window actually the material. So we've got to build some sort of jam extension. Typically I would do those before the foam went on. Um, and you can see that in some, some other animations and even film clips, but there we go. So we've got something around a jam extension is the big thing to push that trim out. And then we've got a three quarter inch material that's being uh, structurally screwed back into the framing, about two inch embedment into the framing. So there's my rain screen component and my cladding attachment system. So I'm structurally attaching. We could talk about the materials, 
but I'm structurally, structurally attaching some thing, then the cladding is going to attach right just to that outside wood strip. Um, so that could be furring, strapping. We typically will rip plywood or some other materials. I'm actually sitting in front of one we've got two inches of mineral wool on. Um, it's built very much like that mock-up that you just show in the animation gourd. So, so um, but the main point is the structure, the structural furring is attached to the framing and the cladding is only attached to the structural furring. And you end up with, you know, Steve Burke often talks about this being the perfect wall. You have incredible thermal performance, incredible water performance, incredible air tightness, and you have a vented rain screen, which your cladding really loves. And so looking for that drainage, getting water from out behind, these are all examples of poor drainage that cladding's attached far too tight, no opportunity for drainage out of that. I'm just mindful of time, but mortar droppings on the brick, the siding attached right tight, that means water could wick back up. Stucco that's only applied over a single layer of building paper with no drainage gap. We want to get to better drainage. Here's a great partner of ours, a, a Dorkin, that has that drain gap, that draining membrane. We just love this behind the synthetic stones, behind the stucco, that three-eighths of an inch, a dimpled drainage gap that really allows that venting in behind the riskiest of claddings. I think you would agree, Justin. Stuccos and uh, synthetic stones are the riskiest yep. of claddings. And often they're an architectural yeah. detail that is a, an option, and we would just say add dollars to that option to get you good water management. There's the scratch coat going on, there's the lick and stick stone, but imagine that drainage, uh, that venting ability in behind is so powerful, so powerful. I'm just mindful we've, of we've that. Tested, so we'll yeah. We tested. We tested a stucco point. version of that last year. It was amazing. So. You've done it, this one recently. We've tested it. Yeah, we've last year. Now we've got another three of these that are going with this uh, drainage, dimple drainage mat on it with stucco. So Very it's, cool. it's nice learning that we're getting. And just as we finish up, we'll go to questions. But then we look at the smaller windows, the smaller penetrations, and recognize that there's more of them than ever before. More plumbing penetrations, more vents. So we have to find a way to seal them. And we're looking for things that are, and we would say on building paper, it's kind of tough to do. What's the approved tape, the approved sealant? There we tried really hard on the right-hand side with tapes around a uh, line set. And more and more of you are doing air conditioning, and you should be putting in vents for air conditioning because otherwise somebody else is going to pop it through your wall, and who's going to be responsible? So there are various strategies. There's a product called uh, Quick Flash. Uh, that, that we brought to Ontario, and it's, it's out of Vegas, but it's a really simple little product, comes in different shapes and sizes so that you can get good water management off of those penetrations. The plumbers love these, the HVAC guys love these because they can move the pipe, they can move the, the, uh, uh, the, the electrical wires and not have to worry about uh, the, the uh, water tightness of that. So a simple little product. Uh, here's a little flexible flashing product that's used. It's called... Um, Flex Wrap EZ that just gives you a really good bond, butyl based, flexible. You get the idea of where we're headed with this kind of thing. On the right hand side, probably the most vulnerable of mechanical penetrations is the line set, both in terms of damage. So, again, this is a product that uh, by, offered by Quick Flash that allows you to get that line set done really neat and clean and no water management issues off of that really vulnerable spot that's so easy to get damaged. So just wanted to play those. And I think I'll stop sharing at that point um, and just remind us of what we were chatting about today, you know, in terms of uh, why water management is so critical. It's, it's frankly because of increased water risks, uh, because of the change in billing materials, because of more insulation in our wall cavities, because of more complicated buildings even darker cladding systems and, and more cladding systems overall. And our job is to make better choices. So let me stop sharing. At, uh, here we are at 2.17. We have about 12 minutes or so, Justin, for comments or questions. Stacy, um, and leave Justin up there solid. That's good because he's the man. Uh, any questions that you would uh, like uh, Justin to answer? Uh, there are quite a few in here. I'm just... Uh going to tie in the one question from Jonathan with um, the one that he mentioned uh, in the chat, which was about the um, one picture you had put up, Gord, with the uh, window openings. Yes. With the down the downspoke question he had with the east trough. So because of deflection and water coming off the roof, do you recommend east troughs for all houses? And so that was regarding that picture you put up which had the two window openings. Yep, thank you. 
Justin, your thoughts, eave troughs on all houses? I, I can tell you, I, I typically would spec them, and I know sometimes in colder climates, like I'll give an example. My brother, um, he bought a house about a decade ago, and I walked up in front of it, and they were, it was in construction from a production builder in Minneapolis. And the build, I met the builder, nice fellow, and he said, yeah, we don't put gutters on eaves troughs. I'm going to call it eaves troughs for you all on, on, on houses because they just collect ice and freeze. Yes. I get that. But the other side is we really want to catch that water and not let it come down to the ground and splash it. And it also has implications like how am I going to deal, especially as we're putting houses closer and closer together, um, what am I going to do to get that water off the site? And if I can pull it to one spot where I know where it is, that's wonderful because then I can, well, pipe it out. Currently, I have my neighbors got one downspout location next to mine, which used to flood the backyard. So we came in, looked at the grade direction and fall in the property trenched a big pipe in, connected his and mine so we could get all that water, which is a good third of the back of each of our houses from creating a big pool there. So that's a big one. I'm also looking at a house uh, right now where the builder said, yeah, we put them down lower off the porch, but I've got a second story roof that dumps onto that porch. So I just got back from this one last week, but all the trim and siding and everything in the stucco on the bottom that surrounds that porch, the water and snow melt has been coming down has wrecked the bottom, say, 18 inches of the wall all the way around. So I said, well, now we have to fix that. But when we do it, we probably should put some, well, guttering on this house to actually pick that water up and dump it strategically where it's supposed to go. And, and we would say, go back to rule number one, deflection. Where's that water going to go? If you're not going to put gutters, Justin says gutters. He speaks three languages, not Canadian. We call them eave traps, not gutters. Uh, uh, I'm kidding you. But if you're not going to put eaves troughs or gutters on, then you have to follow that path of water. And I see a lot in uh, northern Minnesota, northern Canada, because of uh, tree loads, you know, uh, uh, cottage country and so on. They know they're not going to be up there in the fall. They know they're going to have ice. They know they're going to have leaves falling. So they don't want to put eaves troughs on because then i got to clean them. So what they will do, though, is take down at the base where the water is going to drop. They'll put river rock, uh, you know, a landscaping feature that doesn't mm -hmm. allow that water to to splash back on the siding products so that's a good job and then sloping that well away so that water goes to where you want it to go so i think that's a a pretty interesting concept that that we want to think about um and then the question from paul was does a440 seems to require reslope re re sill but other installation standards often don't uh, we would say there are alternatives. Uh, we see a large, a lot of large production builders who wouldn't slope the sill, but they would back dam the sill, that back rot and caulking, for example. So if you're not going to slope the sill, then at least back dam it with a solid bead of caulking and back rod so that the water can't leach back in. Justin, you've got you've shown and show at the CI Center lots of opportunities or uh, uh, options for that. Yeah, and that. that that again is I'll reiterate that that's if, if that's the case where we can't necessarily even slope the sill or you have sloped the sill realize that 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 interior plane of the window uh, where it meets the framing and so forth is is your control line for air and water so so you want to use something robust there to actually if the water gets into that you can push it out as best as possible it's hard to see on this side of me over here is actually a a, a deck ledger interface that we built on one of our shows you can see it on a video but it's got you know a pan flashing on it. it's not sloped but it also has that quick flash product on it to look at what's that if i've got this sort of you know zero rise deck interface where interior meets exterior that everybody wants to do so my my deck is right at you know the bottom of an in-swing door how do i do it and can i pan flash it some of the advantages if you can't slope it well that sure sill product interesting enough has got a little bit of slope built into it and a back dam positive on it. So, so that that's another way to do it. There's multiple ways to do it, but understanding you just want you just don't want it to go the other way, Gordon, run into the building, right? Yeah. And then Jim had a question. He said the demo showed the bottom flange of the window being taped. And we would say, no, actually you don't want to tape it. We see Canadian builders taping it, which is frankly wrong. You don't want to top that uh, yeah. uh, tape that. You might want to, it's okay to skip tape it. Uh, to allow, but you want water to leak out. Somebody's going to say, well, what about wind blowback up underneath? And Justin, we're, you're very uh, conscious of, and there are places where you'd put in a wind skirt. So you drop down yep. a piece of, flex, uh, uh, let's call it WRB, tape that to the flange, hold it down so that the water won't come back up. And you think about wind pressures, that's 8 to 12 inches of a skirting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so exactly. that's one way to and, think and, of it. 
to iterate that, that that was a window that I was instructed to put that blue tape on the bottom of the window, which I, I wouldn't, have, wouldn't have done. So apparently that's the way some people up there may do it. So that was for that test sample. But yes, normally the pan flashing is that, and there's nothing that, that high pressure or wind skirt, maybe you're by a lake or you're coastal or something. That's a great idea is, is to cut six inches wider than the window opening on either side. Sorry, I'm going like this and I'm not in the camera. And then down, say, 12 inches. And it could just be a, a piece of water-resistive barrier that's, that's on the front bottom of the window to keep anything from being pushed up that, that line. But you really do want the drainage out of that assembly. That's the yep. key. And it's Jim also get in asked there. about uh, the use of acrylic tapes as a seal between reverse lap membranes. And, of course, the answer would be don't reverse lap your membranes. But sometimes you're forced to, right? There's just no yep. way around it. And, again, I would say compatible tapes. And sometimes, you know, if you're using a, a thick, uh, John Straub often talks about if you're using a thick, say, butyl tape that might have the chance of fish, fish mouthing that had to be reverse lap, then you would actually take an acrylic tape over top of that. So a double yep. layer of tape is, is where you like to get to. Uh, yeah, that can work, our, that can our, work our well. Good friend. Sorry, go ahead, Justin. I, that can work really well. And sometimes, depending on what it's sticking to, you may be able to use a wet bead of sealant and sort of trowel it out over the top of it as well. It depends on whether that sealant's going to stick to your WRB material. Um, but it is, when you can't, double down, right? Butyl it, acrylic it, butyl it, seal it. But um, yeah, a reverse lap will not be your friend 100 years from now, I don't think. Right. And then our, our good friend Armando from uh, Texas has asked, should WRB and rigid foam manufacturers be required to include in their installation instructions which tapes and sealants? The, exact, the answer is, of course, yes. And the leading manufacturers already do. They will tell you what's compatible. Mm -hmm. And I'm encouraging you all to get letters of compatibility of the products you're using to take away that liability. I, I think it's so powerful to think about that. And then uh, Jonathan's asked, uh, if you're using a house wrap that's self-adhered, are there differences in installation for window openings? And that is an interesting, right? If you're going to use, say, a coated sheathing product, you are, by definition, reverse lapped. So by definition, you better talk to the manufacturer and say, what is my detail there? I'm at a little bit at risk when I use a, 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 a product that's self-adhered. Some of them are now using a, a liquid applied flashing. Uh, over top mm -hmm. of that joint, so there's ways to mitigate it, but there's no doubt about it. They, they are <coughs> reverse lapped, if you will, and you have to have a mitigating factor for that. We are doing one right now, Gord, that is a um, self-adhered membrane going over the entire building. And at the windows, we're actually making a head flap just like you normally would. And we're as, as the, the membrane's going on the outside of the building, we're installing a piece of the backing paper on that head flap and leaving it until after the window goes in so we can get rid of at least the reverse lap at the window head. Yeah. And then Deb was asking, uh, would you suggest still using a drip cap on windows that have a built-in J channel? And, and my answer would be, well, I'll ask you, Justin, because it's actually a pretty interesting one. What do we do there? I typically, uh, I typically, unless there's, if there's not a slope on it, I typically would add a slope flashing on top of the window. It's the slope that would. we want, right? That's what we really want. Slope. Is that and slope. a drip edge. It's the drip edge too. It's Fair a relief enough, yes. to let to let that water go off and let it drop. And that's a, a big one. I'm gonna say that when we do tests, if you just install a window, and now which was really clever, they're starting to install um, almost like for vinyl siding and other things, a, an extension that goes the wrong way, meaning this way on the top of the window coming up that you see a little relief. And that's so the vinyl siding has some sort of a, a relief to it and or you don't have to have a caulk joint between your trim. Well, it's now sticking up and holding water. I'm gonna say that if there's not a slope on it, when we do a test and you put a wind force on it, and again, we're exaggerating at 50 miles an hour, but there's a big slug of water that usually is dancing on top of that that window or any flat surface on the building, a lot, about, I'm gonna say three to five millimeters of water um, that, that's up there. See, I threw it in the SI units just for you guys, Adam. those millimeters. <laughs> uh, and then the next question was, temperature makes window frames expand and contract, of course. Does this movement damage the sealant? And that's the point. 
well, that you want to pick sealants that actually have the commission around, uh, amount of expansion contraction. So that's why you're looking for letters of compatibility. And our, you know, we know the Henkel guys really well, which is LePage in Canada, OSI in the U.S., mm -hmm. and they have these great sealants that give you the proper expansion contraction on those vinyl frame windows. So it's not doesn't make it redundant. What it makes it is use the proper sealants that have that proper expansion contraction and are rated for, for outdoors. Um, and then the next question was, is, is using rigid foam exterior insulation installed with butt joints that's not vapor permeable, does the vapor collect on the tape since the butt joint is the only way out? And it's a great question because the foam's going to expand and contract a little bit. What we're going to say mm -hmm. is if the wall's airtight, you shouldn't have seen any condensation, shouldn't be much moisture movement. So I'm not that worried about that small amount of insul uh, uh, condensation. It shouldn't be there. If your wall's airtight, you have the right amount of insulated sheathing. The more insulated sheathing, the better. So less chance of condensation. So I just remind you of that. Um, it, it's not a big deal with a little bit of condensation there. Uh, and then uh, it, there's a question about particular tension when it comes to passive house installation with water and vapor management. And all we would say is you got a huge amounts of insulation, so you got to do an even better job of water management. The, there are some great materials. In fact, like all the, as long as you're using compatible products, it, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say special attention. I would say every house needs attention to water. But the fact that Passifos is using even more insulation, it means it has less drying potential. Be more conscious of these items. Yep. And it, it's looking at things from a systems perspective. You know, again, Gord, is it if you're using, for example, in that particular house, you, you want to use a full sheet applied peel and stick WRB material. Well, if that manufacturer makes tapes and, and, and sealants that are compatible, and I guarantee you they probably do, because I could name three of them right off the bat that are pretty popular in that application, I'm going to use a suite of products that are compatible with those and also double check and say, like this one's coming up as we as I exit today, we're going to go down and, oh, by the way, you can, with this particular product, I'm not going to name what it is, but you can use a flexible butyl flashing tape on, on their on their WRB material. Okay, because we've got some penetrations to deal with. So is it a quick flash boot or is it a butyl product? They said it's fine, but they also have a lot of other really good materials that are from them, including sealants that they want us to use. It's a compatible suite of systems to make it really wonderful. So we're at 2.30 and I know Justin has to run. So we're into the rapid round. I'm gonna answer three, four questions really, really quickly. Uh, Nick, first of all, I need to give you an apology. I, I owe you a conversation. I know you were looking for me to do some work for the local home builders. My apologies for that, just been too busy. But he's asked, have you ever tested using M seal as part of the sill pan? It prevents drafts, but it still allows water to drain out. I'm totally good with that. If you can find a way at the bottom of window to allow water to still drain out and use a product that prevents drafts. I don't know that particular product, Nick, but I think we're good. Uh, Robert Jonkman said, are the CI animations available? on Windows laptop? And the answer is yes, off our website. They will play just fine. The the app, it doesn't really play at the moment well with Android. There's a little bug in that one. Jonathan's going to, uh, sorry, Justin's going to fix that one real quick. Um, uh, Jonathan asked, Justin mentioned details for patio doors that are on level with a deck. And again, the answer is yes, that, that information, there's good animations on that detail. And uh, Jonathan asked, uh, sorry, Robert Jockman, our good friend at CWC, Speaking of dark colors, any experience with brick cladding that has a color change using spray net or something similar? I don't know specifically that's what that one's about. Robert, we may need to converse on that one. Not quite sure, so we'll perhaps answer that one uh, after the fact. Um, what type of window sill are you suggesting for those contemporary elevations? Traditional elevations have stone there. Do we really care the type of sill? Justin, your thoughts? The type of sill on a stone building or stone facade on the outside. Yeah, exactly. Of it. I, it's gonna if it's gonna have a stone sill on it. Hopefully, it's got a slope to the stone sill, and preferably, we typically come in if it's hanging over, you know, the other uh, facade material, cladding material. Um, it has a drip relief edge on the bottom or somewhere on that stone edge too, which is, is something you typically just have to spec. Hopefully, I'm hitting that one right there. So I'm going to say uh, thank you. I'll go back. I should play. Sorry, let me share quickly while I'm chatting here. There's just a couple of quick slides left. We're almost done, gang. Don't worry. Uh, I, I won't play this one. I'll just say uh, to finish up, I want to say thank you again to Enbridge 
uh, for for their sponsorship of this series and specifically of this issue of this uh, session. Uh, we at Building Knowledge have a quarter, quarterly newsletter, so please sign up for that. You are going to see that. Um, uh, uh, survey monkey asks how well you did. Hopefully, on that survey monkey, you give a big round of applause to Justin and team from CI. John's there, Travis, to put together the clips, and uh, the, I, I just really appreciate you guys taking the effort to do that. You know, I, I would say just I, I just want to thank them for doing such cool stuff. And part of me wanted you to see what what they have going on there, so I encourage you to go down to CI. I just know it's going to be a great experience for you. Uh, so. Please, uh, uh, everybody, give a, a really nice thanks to um, to Justin and uh, and John and, and uh, Travis for that. And then, uh, in terms of the continuing series, uh, there's a uh, not uh, sorry um, Enbridge is holding a session on June 28th on the new province-wide Enbridge natural gas application system. And then we have Andy and Trevor Trainer. You're really going to enjoy Trevor talking about high-performance uh, roof design on July 7th. So again, thank you so much for attending and we'll make sure you get the proper communication. Justin, one last time, thanks very much. Everybody clap for Justin, please. Thank really you, Gord, thanks you. everybody. It's always a pleasure to be able to do anything with your, your group up there and all you Canadians. So I just don't get up there enough, but I need to get up there. So um, I, I miss being up there, but now with things clearing up a little bit, let's hope we can, we can get back in the air. But you're gonna be here next week, Gord. So there you have, there we have a full week, house here session. next week. So can't wait to have you here. Thank you. And apparently you can get up there real fast now with that race car. You don't need the airplane anymore. So. Thanks exactly. again, folks. Really appreciate it. Stacy, are we uh, okay to say goodbye? Yeah, I just wanted to let anyone know that had put any questions in the chat that I did grab them and we'll pass them along to Gord to vet out later and see if you can answer those uh, personally. Great. So thanks. thanks, folks. Really appreciate you coming.